Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Magnify Church. My name is Tate Radiz. I'm a part of our team here. I'm so happy to be with you, to worship alongside of you, whether you're in person or you're joining us online. The Lord is going to bless us. He's going to have his way with us this morning. Will you stand, and we'll start off by singing. off with this morning that all of our hope can be placed in the one who has never failed, who never will, and who will never leave us. As we think of this truth, we can be still. As we place all of our trust in him, no matter what comes our way, we can look to Christ and know that he is with us. Let's sing this together. Yeah, 
patiently the cross of grief for pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul. Thank you so much that you are in control. Thank you that you sent Jesus our hope. And we just put our hope and trust in you today. As many of us have friends and loved ones who are sick, Lord, I just pray that right now, um, amidst the flu season and COVID and everything else going on, that you will just give extra peace and reassurance surrounding all of our sicknesses and symptoms and that you will just be a comfort to us right now, Lord. I also pray for those who have lost a loved one. It seems that around the holidays, we feel the loss so much more deeply. The whole feels bigger. And I pray, Lord, that we will look only to you to fill that space, that we won't look to traditions, Christmas presents, cookies, whatever, whatever it is that we are trying to seek to fill the emptiness, Lord, that we will just remember that you are the healer and that space in our life can only be filled with you. Lord, thank you so much for our, our global partners, Jonathan and Hannah Victor. Thank you that you are encouraging them and spurring them on despite all the obstacles that they have been in their way this year. We rejoice with them over um, the fact that there is some new translations uh, coming out with a couple books of the Bible and also that people have been generous in their giving. Uh, they were able to provide meals for a month for over 100 families because of one person's generosity. Thank you, Lord, for 
moving in people's lives and stirring them to give to, uh, to you and to your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Magnify. My name is Leanne Blackmore, and I am excited to be here with you today. I am here because Jesus is my hope, and that is where, when all else is unstable, this is where I can come because Jesus is my rock. One of the things that I look forward to each year is the candlelight service. I absolutely love coming to this because it just, it just fills me with joy to be able to celebrate uh, with so many people and the lights and the candles. But this year we have four services for you to choose from, and we hope that one of them will work for you and your family. If you go online, you can find all the details. We have lots of different options, kids programming, uh, mask wearing, live streaming. So I encourage you this week to head there, find out what works best for your family. The 10 a.m. service is an RSVP, so please take note of that. We are able to do things like candlelight and even our kids' Christmas program from last week because of your generous giving. So right now we've been talking about the shape of giving, and I would like to introduce you to my friends, Phil and Anita Hoskins, and they're going to come and share how giving has shaped their life. Good morning. We are Phil and Anita. And... Um, just wanted to let you know how Magnify has really uh, given to us and uh, stepped into our life and just poured into us through the different ministries and into our kids also. And um, one of the things over the last few years that we have realized is um, giving is more than just about the money that we're giving. So this is about our heart in it. And um, you know, it's easy to, to let that bank account kind of kind of build up at times, and um, it's easy to find our security in that and our, our put our trust and our faith in that. But when we give money, we've realized that um, we're putting our, our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus to provide for us and not that bank account. That bank account will fail us at some point. So um, that's what it has done through our giving. Magnify has been an awesome resource for our, us for our marriage. Um, the home builders class has been amazing. Our small groups have been challenging. The resources Sunday nights that provide for just us to talk about our marriage. Um, the resources for our kids, whether it's Awana up at Ensley or trick or treating at Northview, or here where we do quack and dance and Easter drama that our whole family gets to participate in. We are so grateful that we are poured into and that we also have the opportunity to pour into others as well, like serving with the youth ministry. We absolutely love doing that and going on trips and staying up till 3 a.m. in the morning, talking with high schoolers is something that I get lots of energy from. And so we have been able to pour into this church and also receive from that. And it has been life-changing with our giving. Thank you, Phil and Anita. And we would love to hear from you guys, too. So if you would like to um, post on social media a short one-minute video clip of how giving has shaped your life, we encourage you to do that with the hashtag Shape of Giving. And today we're not passing the plate, but you can look on the screen for the ways that you can give, and I encourage you to do so. Now will you join me as we take a step back into history with Matt Zania in learning about the life of David. Good morning. If you have a Bible with you, please turn to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 1. In a minute, I'll begin reading at verse 17. This morning, we're going to have a teaching time, but then we're going to have communion near the end, and then Advent will close us. And if you're at home streaming with us, welcome. Uh, but because we have communion, if you want to 
take a moment, if you haven't already done so, to get juice or bread or cracker or something around. You can pause us and then come back and, and pick up uh, right where you left off. So uh, the section of Scripture I'm going to read now is, if you remember, and you were with us last week, Saul, King Saul, and his son Jonathan were killed in battle. And this section I'm going to read is the lament of David over the death of these two men. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he said, it should be taught to the people of Judah, behold, it is written in the book of Jashar. He said, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant you have been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perish. Can you think of a time that you were honored? Somebody or somebody's honored you in some way. I'm thought about this last week, and as I walked into my office, I, I was thinking about it, and I saw on my shelf, I, I have this vest on my shelf. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was uh, over teaching pastors with Life International in India, and I've been there three times, and I was in a new place, and we taught, uh, we were there five days and spent a lot of time with these men and women and taught and had a good time. And at the end, they took a minute and brought me up front because they wanted to honor me. And my host gave me this vest. And in the area of India he was in, all the different tribes have a different vest with a design and embroidery. And somebody put a lot of time and effort and work into this. And they just gave it to me. As if to say, you're one of us. Welcome. What an honor. How have you been honored? So I want us to think about that as we go through our teaching today. And I want to take this period right after Saul's death. So Saul and Jonathan are killed on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines have come in and uh, defeated them. And right at the time, Saul is wounded. Jonathan's already dead. Saul is wounded. He asks his armor bearer to run him through with a sword so he won't be killed by the Philistines. And, and the sword armor bearer is terrified. He won't do it. And so Saul falls on his own sword takes his life. And here's part of what happened afterward. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons 
fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. So when they find the king of their enemy, we see what they do. And the body's going to go on display. The armor, you serve to God. Our God's clearly stronger. So your armor's going to go in the temple of our goddess. And so this is a way of humiliating and dishonoring your opponent. And it was commonly done. And that's what they do to Saul and Jonathan and Israel. Some Israelites hear about it and they do something about it. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. Ah, these men want to restore honor to their king, to God, to Israel. How long did they wait to act on this? They didn't wait at all. They went through the night. And they got there, retrieved what they came for, and they burned it, not to cremate it, but because these bodies had been uh, cut up and uh, not only wounded, but I'm sure there was some decay. So they burned them down to the bones, and then they gave the bones an honorable barrier. That's how important honor was in Israel, in the ancient Near East. And what we're going to see with this story now was Saul and Jonathan dead. The chaos begins to resolve that we saw last week. And so we looked at the, the triangular relationship with these three. And Saul's envy, we watched it escalate and create chaos and murder and hatred. But now that's going to fade, and our, the chaos of the story is going to begin to diminish. What happens, David hears about the killing of Saul when a man comes, an Amalekite. And he had come upon the slain body of Saul, taken his crown, and come back. And now he's going to report to David. So when he first gets there, David honors him, and asks for a report. And the man gives a report that he saw, he was there with Saul, and Saul was alive. Now he's making this up because he's trying to gain honor under false pretenses from David. So he says, I was there, and Saul was mortally wounded, and he asked me to kill him, so I killed him. And he thinks this is going to get him honor with David. Have you ever tried to get honor under false pretenses? Well, this man did. And when David, he believes the guy. He doesn't know he's lying. And he says, how dare you dare to touch the king's anointed and to kill him? And David has this man killed. So expecting honor... David sees the truth, the dishonor, and he has him killed. And then David laments, and the, that's what I read at the start, he laments Saul and Jonathan to give them honor. And notice how he only had good to say. This is Saul, who, who's been trying to kill him repeatedly, who has made 
the last decade of his life miserable. And yet when he gets the chance to speak to about him post-death, he honors him. And if you've ever been to a funeral, I assume you have, where you know the person wasn't that great a person, but then you hear people talk about him at the funeral, and you're like, wow, they're really honoring him. He wasn't that great. Well, there's a long tradition for that. And there is something maybe even right about doing that. Well, from here, David is going to be anointed king of Judah. He's already been anointed by God as a king, but now his tribe of Judah and the land they're in, there are 11 areas of land, 12 tribes. Levites don't get land. So in his tribe, in his land, he is anointed king at that point. And then he calls on God and he asks God, God, where would you like me to go? What city would you like me to go to? And God tells him, go to Hebron. And he does. But notice, he seeks God. He's very different than Saul. And by seeking God before he moved, he honors God. And then he hears about the men of Jabesh Gilead who retrieved Saul and Jonathan's bodies and gave them an honorable burial. And then he blesses and honors them. And now from here, the kingdom of Israel, united, is going to begin to solidify. And this kingdom is going to be formed. But before it's all one, we have uh, Saul or David as king over Judah, but the other ten tribes have a new king, a different king, a surviving son of Saul, Ishbosheth, and he's going to be king for two years but he's a weak king. And David has a key military guy, Joab. And Ish-bosheth has a key military man, Abner. And these two are going to fight and be at odds because they're trying to prevail for their king. And what Abner is doing is right and good because he doesn't know about the king's anoint or God's anointing of David and all that. So Ish-bosheth is the rightful heir in the world's eyes. Well, in their conflict, Abner's going to kill Joab's brother, Asahel. And then he's going to go back to his area and fight for his king, Ishbosheth. But Ishbosheth accuses him of something and dishonors him. So Abner then comes and meets with David, says, David, I will become your ally, and I will bring the rest of Israel to you. And they sign a pact in a very honorable way. But as Abner's leaving, Joab sees Abner leaving, and he hears he has a pact now with David. And Joab sends for Abner under false pretenses. He lies, says, the king wants you back here. And when Abner comes, Joab kills him. And David mourns Abner. He does not praise Joab because what was done was done dishonorably. And the people see David mourning Abner at his funeral. And his sincere honoring of Abner actually begins to unite the people, even though Ishbosheth is still in power. And what we see is, we begin to see the power that sincere, God-centered honoring has. Not just in the person being honored, but the people around. All the chaos is going to continue to clear as we go. And Ishbosheth is going to be killed by two of his captains. And they come and kill him while he's asleep, midday. And they kill him in a very dishonorable way. 
but they then go to David. <laughs> they cut off his head, and they go to David. They say, the Lord, God, has avenged my Lord, you, King David, through us. <laughs> David will have none of that. What you did was dishonorable. And he kills those two captains, and he cuts off their hands and feet, and he hangs them in public so everybody can see and look on them with dishonor. But now Ishbosheth is dead, and David is anointed king over all of Israel. He's 30 years old. He's going to serve for 40 years. And then David does his first recorded act, military act, as a king of the united Israel. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking, David cannot come in here. All right. This is going to become the city of Jerusalem. It is not a key city. It's not on a key trade route. It is not key militarily. But it's in the area, the land of Judah, right on the border of Benjamin and Judah. And the allure of the city is that it's on the border, at least to David. It's on the border. It's in their territory. It has high walls, and it has something very valuable in the ancient Near East if you want to protect your city. And what it has is a water source that is protected. People can't see it, and they guard it. And so if siege is laid to their city, the Jebusites can outlast a siege because they have water. And so, because of their water and their high walls, they just tell David, the weakest people in my kingdom, in my city, could keep you out. And he's dishonoring David. But David prevails. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. So what happens is they find the protected secret water source and they're able to overtake the few men guarding it and they come up into the city through the water source. And if you go to Israel today, Jerusalem, you can see where all this happened. It's pretty amazing. But now he has established what's going to be his capital, God's capital. And David's city is established. And let's take a look real quick what it looked like then. You've seen it a couple times already. Here is the high part of the city, and it goes downhill, and there's three valleys in this area. And up here, right behind it, it's a little higher. And that area is going to be where the temple is going to build, be placed. And Solomon's going to build the temple where the Ark of the Covenant is going to go into. And this is the spot where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. So if you go to Israel today, this is right where the Temple Mount is today. And they have excavations of this city now. But what I want you and I to understand is as we're, we're watching the kingdom solidify right in the middle of this story is the establishing of Jerusalem as God's capital. But what's, what's going on all around in the stories and its honor? And yes, they use military might to capture the city, but what really establishes a people with loyalty and love and true strength? It's honor. Each act of honor David does builds the city. 
And it's almost like the acts of honor are bricks that build a city. In a similar way, that's how God's kingdom is built today. We'll talk more about that in a bit. But now the kingdom continues to strengthen at this point. And David's going to defeat the Philistines. They're going to attack, come into a valley. David calls on God. He defeats them. They come back. He calls on God again, and, and God says, go behind them. And when you, when you hear the noise of, of an army coming in the tops of the trees, I have delivered them to you. And he does. And now David sends for the ark of the covenant, the meeting place, the place where God meets with humanity. He's going to bring that now into Jerusalem. And so the ark is packed for travel. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Amonadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah, an Ahot, Ahio, the son of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. So they go, they build this cart, they load it up, and now they're heading to Jerusalem, to the new capital. But something goes wrong. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. Wow. Are you like me? And does a little careful question about how fair that was to Uzzah. He's just trying to help. And I think David feels some of that because he's angry. So whose fault was this? It was David's. And once again, David's mistake is dishonor of God is going to cost somebody else their life, just like the priest of Nob. You see, God, way back under Moses, gave instructions how to build the ark. And the ark was built with these rings on it, and it's gold. And those rings are there because there was a certain way you were supposed to carry it, and only the Levites are supposed to carry it. And they put these long rods of wood in there. And they're long. And so when they're carrying it, it's on their shoulders. It's not in a cart. Not with oxen. Why? Well, one reason might be don't put it in a cart with oxen because it might fall out. If you have men carrying it on their shoulders, that's a much more careful way to do it. But it's the way God described, and and to honor God is to obey him. We learned that last week. We learned that through all of Scripture. And so David here, the man who has done so well with honor, is bringing God into the midst of the capital and the united kingdom of Israel in a dishonorable way. And it's going to sit. He's going to leave it. And it's going to sit for three months. And then word comes that the, the, the family, the clan in which it, area it sits is being blessed greatly. And so David sends to bring that. He reads that most likely as the anger of the Lord has subsided and the blessing of the Lord has continued on. And as he's bringing it into the city, he's wearing an ephod of a priest, and he's dancing all over the place to celebrate its entry into the city. 
and his wife Machal sees him. <laughs> she despises him because he's a king. He's acting like a commoner. And he's dressed as a priest, and he's acting that way. Machal, if you remember, it's his wife, and it's Saul's daughter. She despises him. And because of that, she will be barren the rest of her life. And so David was honoring God. Michal dishonored him in her opinion. So what we see emerging from this section of the story becomes quite clear. Honor. This whole section has honor and dishonor. And the importance of honor is not to be missed by us. And so we look at the events of dishonor and honor in this section, and here are just some of them. And I want to use this to kind of help illustrate. So we see the acts of dishonor, the Philistines and the Amalekite who lied and Ishbosheth and all of these, the assassins, and these are all acts of honor. But we see David, and each act of honor is a brick. And he honors the men of Jabesh Gilead. He laments Saul. He laments and honors Abner. He seeks God in all he does. He celebrates the ark. And all the while, as he honors, he builds the city. He builds the city of God. And so as you and I, we read this story and we watch honor and then we extract what's being told in this story and something important is meant to come forward and it's us to understand the church our church as a place where honor is restored, where honor is spoken, where anybody who comes through these doors or experiences us out in the world will get a taste of Christ-centered honor. And every time we do that, we build a put a brick on his church in our community. His church is a place of honor. The New Testament bears this out with great clarity. And so we, we see the importance of honor uh, in a story with Jesus. He is confronted by Pharisees because his men were, were very hungry and they they grab some grain to eat on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees confront Jesus about it. No, your followers are eating on the Sabbath. They're harvesting. And then Jesus points out their hypocrisy, how they teach, honor your father and mother, but then you have a new rule where if you're a Pharisee, you don't have to take care of your widows. He says, how do you do that? And then he says this, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And this is just a version of obedience is better than sacrifice. Some honor people, but not God. Some of us honor God, but not the people around us. And the church of Jesus Christ are to do both, simultaneous. Christ followers do both. It's a version of the double love command. Love God, love others. And in Romans and elsewhere, a key aspect of love in Romans verse 10 is honor. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 
You see, Paul is always trying to define love. He knows it's abstract and it gets it kind of gets um, deconstructed down into meaning a lot of different things. And so when we read Paul's letters, he is putting meat and flesh on this idea of love. And honor, you and I are to be outdoing one another with honor. What if you and I, okay, it's a terrible year in a lot of ways. We're at the coming to Christmas. We're trying to celebrate it. It's hard to celebrate for many of us, at least not like we like to. And so much has been lost. There's this cloud everywhere. And we snipe at each other, we critique, we posture, we look down on each other. We dishonor each other continually with our words and our actions and our thoughts. What if we unleash the power of honor in new ways this Christmas? What if the COVID Christmas becomes, for our household, a time we can look back to when we turn the corner on understanding how to be, how to show honor and see the power of honor. There's so much has been lost, but there's so much more we can gain if we see this. So what I want to do is I'm going to read you, I, I jotted down 10 ways, 10 ideas. So we're always racking our brains for Christmas gift ideas, right? And so I'm going to give you 10 of the best presents you can give. Here are 10 ways you and I can honor the people in our life. All right? Number one, the number one way to honor somebody is to forgive. It doesn't mean that true wrong wasn't done to you. I'm not saying that. But to forgive is to relent on our case against people. and to see what good is there. And if there isn't good there, look to God. Number two, confess. Maybe you have something to confess. Maybe it's a shameful act, or maybe it's a pattern of behavior that God has shown you. Maybe you need to confess that, not only to God, but the person offended. Don't just confess it to someone, confess it to the person who will be honored when you do it. Related to that, an apology, to apologize. When I say apologize, a full apology, not I apologize, if I, whatever I did, I'm sorry for, or I'm sorry you feel that way. No, I did X. I am sorry I did that to you. I won't do that again. To acknowledge, acknowledge things in other people's lives, call them out like this. <laughs> Bring honor to what somebody else has done, who they are. Every uh, year when it's somebody's birthday, at the end of the night, we gather for prayer we, and we have a time of gratitude. But when it's somebody's birthday in our house, everybody goes around and says something they like about that person. And Sometimes we come to that a, a birthday and people are kind of moaning, I don't want to do that. I said, so, hey, to learn how to speak words of honor into each other's life is lost. We need to be able to do that as the people of God. And when we do it, don't put a little joke or a barb with it. Speak honor and let it sit there and do its work. Presence. To give somebody your time, your undivided attention, and to listen to them, not give advice, not give your story. Number six, connect. Who's somebody that you haven't talked to in a while? And it would feel awkward to connect with them, and you wonder what's going on with them. Call them. Not with an agenda, just to say hi, connect. Number seven, truth. 
to speak truth with clarity to another person is to honor them. But too often, we speak truth with anger or we won't speak truth because we want to, we're too, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. But to speak truth in a loving, Christ-centered way is to honor their humanity and to honor their desire to be a better person. Number eight, wait on people. Christ waited on us. He still waits on me in some ways. If he can wait on me, I can wait on you. I will honor the Lord's work in your life because you may come around to the Lord or to seeing stuff after I'm long gone. But I can wait on that. And I want to honor you. Number nine, open. Open yourself up to people. When we're closed, when we want other people to share, but not ourselves, and we're always asking them questions, but we deflect questions, we're not, we're not honoring people. We're, we're elevating ourselves. And, and it may feel like we're below them, humble, but we're actually elevating ourselves. We do great honor to each other by sharing ourselves, by opening up a struggle, a, a feeling, even a lot of good thoughts things we like that we may think people think are, open up, it honors people. And the final one is to have a meal together. Now, I know with COVID, you can't do a lot of that. But this morning, we're going to practice this honoring of each other by having communion. And so what we're going to do is uh, Tate is going to come up and uh, he's just going to play for a short time, and he is uh, going to play and give us about a minute and a half of reflection time. So take time to think about this topic of honor and reflect on it and where God might want you to honor somebody today. And then I'll come back and we'll read our scripture and, and take our symbolic meal together. From the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote these words about this meal. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant 
in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand together and let's read a piece of Scripture as our prayer, our post-communion prayer. Follow with me as we read this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated, and now we're going to have a time of our Advent. Good morning, Magnify. We're the Lentz family. It's time now for our special preparations for Christmas. Today is the third Sunday in Advent, and we would like to invite all those worshiping at home to get a candle and light it along with us. Why do we light candles and celebrate Advent? Advent means the arrival of someone or something important. Baby Jesus arrived on Christmas. Yes. Jesus was, is called the son of David. And since we are learning about David in our teaching times this month, Our Advent candles help us to remember some of the ways that David pointed to the coming of Jesus. Our first Advent candle reminded us that David and Jesus were both shepherds. shepherds. And our second Advent candle reminds us that both David and Jesus were also warriors. Let's see what our clue is for the third candle. A cross. Jesus came not only to be born as a baby, but also to die on the cross so that he could deliver us from sin and death. 
When David became king, he had to deliver his people from many enemies, from the Philistines and the Ammonites, the Moabites, and other nations. But each time, God enabled David to triumph over all of his enemies. David always gave the credit to God. In, in Psalm 18, too, David said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He was pointing us to Jesus, who would bring us our ultimate deliverance from sin and death and provide us with the horn of salvation. It's time to light the deliverer candle. What's amazing is that he didn't just come to deliver us from death, but Jesus also came to deliver us from all the things that can overwhelm us while we're still alive, too. Right now, and David wrote about all of this in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please stand and join with us. In his green pastures and by his still waters, he delivers us from anxiety and stress. As we walk through dark valleys, he delivers us from fear. Through his death on the cross and his resurrection, he delivers us to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we are so grateful that you sent your Son, Jesus, into the world to deliver us from sin and death. He took, he took the punishment for our sins on the cross. Thank, Thank you that he rose from the dead and now sits at your right hand interceding for us. Father, the world around us can be consuming and overwhelming right now. Please strengthen our faith to trust our shepherd to be our warrior and to deliver us from anxiety, stress, and fear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, kids, for joining us. You guys can be dismissed with your leaders back to your classrooms right now. And everyone else, you may take a seat. We'll give them just a moment to get back to their rooms before I dismiss you. At Magnify, we care deeply about the next generation. And one of the ways that we would like to partner with you parents and grandparents in this journey is to share with you some Christmas stories. We have selected a few books that we think every home library should have with them. And so if you don't mind, for a moment, I'm going to just briefly tell you about each one. The first one is Mortimer's Christmas Manger by Karma Wilson. This is a cute story about a little mouse who is tired of his home in the hole in the wall. And so he goes in search of a house. He finds a cozy little home, but there are some figurines in here. He even goes so far as to remove a little tiny baby from a manger so that he can have a new bed. This story follows this mouse Mortimer as he learns about the true story of Christmas through living in this manger. Another story that we would like to highlight is called Song of the Stars by Sally Lloyd-Jones. If you don't know Sally's work, she has an amazing talent of being able to connect the Old Testament to the New Testament, showing where Jesus is woven through the book of the Bible and connects the pieces together. In this story here, Song of the Stars, she has taken nature and animals and weaves them together at the story of creation. As animals all over the world sense Jesus is coming. It's time. It's time. And we can share this with our children. Also, Mary's First Christmas by Walter Wangren Jr. This story has beautiful illustrations. Just looking at the pictures, it just brings a smile to my face. But this story, Jesus tells, or sorry, Mary tells her five-year-old 
son Jesus about the night that she w- or he was born. And it is just a beautiful depiction of the Christmas story as it is told from Mary to Jesus in just the beauty of how he came to save us. And he was fully human and fully God. So these are um, uh, uh, three resources that we encourage you to look at, see if one of them or all of them would be good for your family. If you're interested in them, head to Magnify's app, and you can um, find these books through there. So I just want to thank you guys for coming today, for sharing your time with us, and you are dismissed.